War of the Shifting Sands. A Warcraft short story by Mickey Nielsen. The midday sun fixed its unflinching gaze upon the sands of Siltius, bearing mute witness to the multitudes forming ranks outside the scarab wall. It continued its passage, though to the masses gathered below it seemed as though the orb had stopped to cast down unrelenting waves of heat until the vast armies simply collapsed from exposure. Amid the restless foundations, a lone night elf stood in quiet contemplation. Her companions eyed her with admiration, some almost reverence. The others who were gathered, an assortment of representation from every race in every land in the known world, viewed her with their own racial prejudice. After all, the blood feud between the Night Elves and the likes of Trolls and Tauren dated back centuries. No matter their afflictions, however, all who had come to battle that day shared one sentiment for the Night Elf. Respect. Shiromar was like the sun above, impassive, unwavering, unflinching. These qualities had served her well in the recent months, providing her with the strength to continue when all seemed lost, when the quest seemed never-ending, and when her companions had simply given up. There had been the Watcher and the Caverns of Time, there had been the Bronze Dragon and the Broodlord and the Squirming Insect Hives, then there were the Shards and their Keepers, the Ancient Dragons, none of whom would give up their charge easily. Ingenuity and sometimes outright violence all were employed to accomplish the task. And all of this for one item. The item gripped in Shiramar's hands even now, the scepter of the Shifting Sands, reformed at last after a thousand years. In the end, all roads led to here, to Silthius, and to the gates of the Scarab Wall, here where the scepter was shattered. Shiramar looked up at the sky and remembered a time when the sun had been eclipsed by dragons, when the courage and the Siltid flooded over the legions of night elves in a seemingly eternal wave, when hope seemed but a shadow. It seemed as if none would survive those terrible months, yet here she was standing before the sacred barrier that saved their lives all those years ago, during the War of the Shifting Sands. Fandral Staghelm led the charge, his son Valstan at his side. They had chosen the gorge so that their flanks would be protected against the unending flow of the Slithid. Shiramar was close behind the front line, casting spells as quickly as her energies would allow. They had fought their way to the mouth of the gorge. Vandral and Valstin, accompanied by the most battle-hardened sentinels, keepers and priestesses, with the druids healing and cast exhaustedly. It seemed that for every massive cluster of slithied that was destroyed, hundreds more would take their place. So it had been for the last few days, since word of the Slithid incursion had first arrived, and Fandral had sounded the call to arms. The priestess Shiramar and her companions had all regained enough energy to call upon the Blaise of Elune simultaneously. They now watched as a blinding column of light obliterated the swarm, blocking the gorgeous terminus. Then, a low buzzing sound fills the air. One by one, flying insect creatures, the winged Kyurashi, flew over the lip of the gorge and down, striking at the druids in supporting positions. 
Thandral led the front line from the gorge into the open sands, stepping over the corpse mounds of the slithid. The air was alive with the thrumming of the Kraji as they swooped down and slashed with clawed appendages. Thandral pressed forward to allow the supporting ranks room to spread out. As she looked to a ridge in the distance, Shiramar witnessed the swarms of landbound Kraji pouring over the crest like ants, swarming from a hill. A towering monstrosity lumbered into view, swinging clawed limbs, looming over all, shouting commands to the insect soldiers. Among the chattering and droning of the swarms, one sound seemed to repeat in the presence of the commanding warrior. Rajax, Rajax. Though Shurmar did not understand the Karaji's communications, she wondered if that might not be the creature's name. As the next wave drew near, her great horn sounded from the east and west. Multitudes of night elves charged onto the field. With a blood-curdling cry, Fandral and Valston pressed straight into the heart of the oncoming swarm. The two sides clashed and melted into each other as the newly arrived forces crushed in on both flanks. Shirmar felt for sure that they had won out, but as the shadows grew long and day proceeded into night, the battle continued. In the centre of the fray, Fandral, Falstin, and the Kraji general clashed in a desperate struggle. As Shurimar narrowly avoided several attacks from the winged Kraji, she glanced back to where the general battled father and son. The numbers of the enemy would were dwindling, and the general seemed to sense this, for with a mighty leap he bounded away back to the ridge where Fandral had first spotted him. From there he disappeared, and the few remaining insect creatures were quickly eradicated. That evening, watches were set as the night elf forces rested. Fandral knew that the Kuraji threat had not been fully quelled, and he expected the battle to begin anew the following morning. Throughout the night, Shiramar slept only in brief increments, the din of battle still ringing in her ears, though the surrounding desert remained quiet. With morning, as the troops reformed and pushed on to the ridge, they were greeted by an eerie stillness. Shiramar scanned the horizon, but the Kuraji and Slithid were nowhere to be seen. As Fandral prepared to press on, her messenger arrived with dire news. The town of Southwind was under attack. Fandral considered pulling the troops back to defend the village, but he sensed that such an action would only leave an open door to invasion from the remaining Kuraji. They still had no idea of just how many the insects numbered, or even if they had seen all that this new race had to throw at them. Valstan correctly guessed his father's thoughts and offered to lead a detachment to the village so that Fandral could stay and provide containment. Standing close by, Shiramar heard the rest of their conversation play out. It could be a ruse, Fandral said. Surely we can't take that chance, father, Falstan answered. I'll go. I'll defend the city, and I will return victorious, upholding the honour of your name. Reluctantly, reluctantly, Fandral nodded. Just return alive, and I will be more than satisfied. Valston gathered a detachment, and Fandral watched his son depart. Shiramar worried that their forces were divided, but she understood the necessity of the action. For the next few days, Shiramar and the others battled wave after wave of slithid streaming from the hives scattered throughout the land. Still, the Kuraji remained unseen. A feeling of dread began working its way under Shiramar's skin. She felt a bad omen that the Slithied Masters had not appeared for so long. 
She worried over the fate of Valston, and at several points throughout each day during lulls in the continuous butchering, she spied Fandral quietly looking back over the horizon, anxiously anticipating his son's return. On the third day, as the noonday sun reached its zenith, Koraji appeared, their numbers reinforced. Once again the buzz of insect wings stirred the air, once again numerous multitudes crested the rim of the horizon. They spread out before Fandral, who the others, like the shadow cast by a giant cloud obscuring the sun, and stopped, and waited. Thunderl formed his lines, and stood at the forefront of the ranks as stormcrows circled overhead, and druids clawed the dirt in anticipation of all watching intently. Moments later, the ocean of insects parted, and the hulking form of the general approached, carrying a wounded figure in its clawed appendage. It proceeded to the front of the Kuraji lines, and held Valston Staghelm aloft for all to see. Gasps spread throughout the ranks. Shiramar felt her heart sink. Thandral stood mute, knowing that Southwind had fallen, and fearing that his son may already be dead. He cursed himself for allowing the boy to leave, and stood frozen by a mixture of fear, anger, and despair. Within the general's claw, Valston stirred and spoke to the general, although he was too far away to be heard. At once the spell that had fallen over Fundral broke, and he bolted forward, followed by the night elf forces, but the distance was great, and even before the Kouraji general acted, Shiramar knew that they could not reach Valston in time. The Kouraji general fixed his second claw onto Valston's bloodied form, and with both he squeezed and pulled apart, separating the young knight elf's body at the waist. Thandral slowed, faltered, and fell to his knees, the unrushing night elves parting around him. As the two forces finally clashed, a sandstorm rushed in from the east, blocking out all light, choking, stifling. Shiramar felt the winds force her movements nearly to a halt. She blocked her eyes as best she could, the howling wind buffeting her ears, drowning out the sounds of battle and the screams of her dying comrades. Through the chaos, she glimpsed the murky behemoth shadow of the Koraji general not far away, slashing and reaping through rows of night elves like a harvester shearing wheat. Then she heard Fandal, his voice ghostly through the storm, calling for the armies to fall back. Much of what followed seemed to happen rather quickly, although in fact it took days. Fandral led his forces out of Silithus, through the mountain passes and into the bowl of the Ungoro crater, the Slithid and Kouraji legions never far behind, consuming those who fell just beyond the protection of the primary force. Once inside Ngoro, however, a strange thing happened. Word spread throughout the ranks that the Kuraji had fallen back, just as the forces had passed the edge of the crater. The archdruid gathered the remaining troops in the bowl centre and gave the order to stand fast. Finally, a lull had come in the fighting, the fleeing and the dying. But the night elves had suffered a bitter defeat, and Fandral Staghelm's demeanour had changed forever. Shiramar watched as Fandral stood guard, looking out from Fireplume Ridge, the stream of the volcanic vents rising behind him, the orange lava glow illuminating his face, a mask that concealed only the deepest anguish, the sorrow known only to parents who have outlived their children. The sudden retreat of the Kouraji puzzled Shiramar. The more she thought on the more she thought on the subject, 
The more she remembered the legends surrounding the crater, rumours that it had been built in the primordial age by the gods themselves. Perhaps they watched over the land. Perhaps their blessings still anointed this place. One thing, however, was for certain. If a plan was not devised to stem the tide of the insect race, Kalimdor would be lost forever. The War of the Shifting Sands continued for long, agonizing months. Shiramar managed to survive battle after battle, but always the Night Elves were on the defensive, always outnumbered, always being driven back. Out of desperation, Fandral sought the aid of the elusive Bronze Dragonflight. Their initial refusal to interfere was reversed when the Brazen Koraji attacked the Caverns of Time, home and province of Nosdormu, the Timeless One. Nosdormu's heir, Anachronos, agreed to enlist the Bronze Dragonflight against the marauding Koraji. Every able-bodied night elf joined the cause, and together they forged a campaign to retake Silithus. Even with the might of the dragons backing them, however, the sheer numbers of the Koraji and Slithid proved overwhelming. And so Anachronos called upon the prodigy of the remaining flights, Marathia, child of Eurysia, the green flight, Kalistras, child of Alexstrasia from the red, and Aragos, child of Malagos, from the blue. The dragons and winged Karaji clashed in the cloudless sky above Scythalus, and as the whole of the Kalimdorian night elf forces streamed in across the sands, even so it seemed that the numbers of Karaji and Slithid were never-ending. Shiramar later heard whispers that the dragons flying above the ancient city from which the Koraji emerged saw something distressing there, something that hinted at a more ancient, terrifying presence behind the onslaught of the insect race. Perhaps it was this revelation that spurred the dragons and Fandral to hatch their final, desperate plan, to contain the Koraji within the city, to erect a barrier that would confine them, until a more hopeful stratagem could be devised. With the aid of the four dragon flights, the final push to the city began. Shiramar marched behind Fandral as the corpses of the winged Koraji fell from the sky. High above, the dragons were making short work of the insect soldiers. As one, the night elves and dragons formed a moving war, which pressed the Koraji back towards the city of Ankaraj. But... Near the city gates, the tide turned, and it was all the combined forces could do to hold the line. To push any further would be impossible. Marathea and the other newcomer dragons decided to push into the city, hold the Koraji back long enough for Anachronus, Fandl, and the remaining druids and priestesses to create the magical barrier. And so... The three dragons and their companions flew headlong into the Koraji legions, into the city where they hoped their sacrifice would not be in vain. Outside the gates, Fandral called upon the druids to focus their energies, as Anachronus summoned the enchanted barrier. Beyond the gates, the three dragon progeny succumbed to overwhelming forces as the Koraji surged forth. Shiramar concentrated her energies and called upon the blessing of Elune, as the barrier erected itself before their eyes, rock and stone and roots from beneath the sands emerging to create an impenetrable wall. Even the winged soldiers who attempted to fly over the barrier met with an invisible obstruction that they could not pass. The Koraji who remained outside the wall were quickly slain, the corpses of Koraji, night elves and dragons littered the bloody sands. Anachronus motioned to a scarab scuttling between his feet. As Shiramar watched, the creature froze, then flattened out, transforming into a metal gong. Stone shifted into place near the wall, creating a die where the gong was finally placed. The great dragon then proceeded to the severed limb of one of his fallen companions. He held the appendage, and after a series of incantations, the limb morphed into the shape of a scepter. 
the dragon told Fandral that should any mortal ever wish to pass the magical barrier and access the ancient city, they need only strike the scepter against the gong and the gates would open. He then handed the scepter to the arch-druid. Fandral looked down, his face twisted in contempt. I want nothing to do with Silithus, the Karaji, and least of all, any damned dragons. With that, Fandral swung the enchanted object into the magical gates, where it splintered into a shower of fragments and walked away. Would you shatter our bond for the sake of pride? the dragon asked. Fandral turned. My son's soul will find no comfort in this hollow victory, dragon. I will have him back. Though it takes millennia, I will have my son back. Fandral then strode past Shiramar, who could see him in her mind even now, as if it were only yesterday and not a thousand years past. One by one, the gathered forces of Kalimdor looked to her, waiting. She struck out towards the day, passing humans and tauren and gnomes and dwarfs and trolls, races whom her kind had fought against, who were now united to end the threat of the Koraji once and for all. Shiramar stood at the base of the steps and took a deep breath. She climbed to the top of the dais and hesitated only for a second. Then, with one mighty swing, she smashed the scepter into the ancient gong.